Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I almost skipped up here. <clears throat> Best not do that. <laughs> well, it's beautiful out. A little reprieve from the rain, at least for a little while. Um, for those of you watching online, welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Please give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know that you're watching with us this morning. Before I get to any, and I know it's already got the person I spoke here, before I get to that, um, Diane's not feeling well today, but uh, so I'll do this for her. On behalf of uh, her family, uh, we want to thank everyone for their prayers over the past several years for Anne. And uh, we were able to very proudly lay her to rest this past week. So thank you for that. There is a card over by the, on the table over there if you'd like to take a look at that. It's got a picture that they used for her her program from her 80th birthday. She was a, a wonderful lady. Moving on from that, a little Get rid of that. Uh, this, uh, or this Saturday, this Wednesday, we have our Bible study at 7 o'clock. We'll be picking up where Pastor Mark leaves off this morning uh, with two or five, which is the vision, engaging in grace. So uh, you'll want to join us for that. We'll start at 7 with the video, go into that, the video discussion afterwards, and then have our time of prayer. Next uh, up on the calendar is... Besides worship next Sunday at 10, on uh, Sunday the 16th, well, actually, that's two weeks. I'm just a little out of sorts, sorry. On the 16th at 4 o'clock, we'll be out at Lowe's Park doing the Freedom Festival Flight Retirement Ceremony, where we'll, we will be honoring our fallen veterans. Mark and I have the distinct uh, honor and pleasure of not only uh, watching as the American flags are retired, but we will be reading off the names of the Iowa veterans who we've lost over the past year. So we invite you to join us for that. Our next men's breakfast will be Saturday, July 6th, and I already know I've got a confirmation of two new people coming next month, so uh, we may have to set out a few more tables, make a few more shipwrecks. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you weren't with us yesterday, guys, we had uh, shipwrecks uh, for, for the folks that know how to eat normally. There was ones with peppers and onions. And then for those of us like myself who don't know how to eat anything beyond the regular meat and potatoes, uh, they had the regular ones without that. So just the hash browns and the ham and the eggs. And between that and the pancakes and the biscuits and gravy, oh, and the biscuits and gravy pie. Pizza. Uh, this time it was pie. It turned out to be a pie. And it it came in because of it in the little pan. I'm not sure what a pizza would take on that. And I'm not sure if there'll be one next month or if it'll just be pie again or if we just have regular biscuits. There will be some format of biscuits and gravy, period. Because, you know, our men's group does not meet without biscuits and gravy. There might be a backlash. But we invite you to join us on the 6th at 9 a.m. for that. And then in July... Uh, it will be the week after uh, the 4th, we'll be beginning uh, the Bible epic mini-series. So uh, we have uh, taken lessons uh, with outreach, and we will be able to show all 10 episodes on Wednesday nights, and we will do a Bible study and sermon series along with that. And then the final announcement, because you probably all were expecting this earlier, this next week, we will not be doing uh, the June uh, Orange Track Racing scheduling conflict. Be out of town at my, dare I say it, 40th class reunion. But there's somebody in here that's getting ready for the 50th. That's Deb. That's Deb. Okay. <laughs> I believe Deb's on the same committee as you are. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. well, yeah, that there too. There's that. <laughs> and I just talked to somebody on. Thursday who was having their 45th so uh, lots going on with that but uh, so we will not have June races but we will have our July races 
In addition to the July rip and zip class, we will do the June rip and zip press because we want to give away that little metal that comes with that. So we'll be doing that. If you're watching online, please watch for the link for the worship music. Last week we had a little problem with the tiny URL. Facebook kicked it out again, but we prepared. You get the long one from YouTube. It's in there, you can click on it. If you have trouble getting to it or you can't get back to it after the service, just message the church uh, and we will send that link to you. With that, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for this weekend, Father. And Father, there has been so many things going on in our lives. There have been so many people who we have lost over the last few weeks. But Father, yesterday we got to celebrate newness and as we, I had the pleasure of uniting two wonderful young people in marriage. So we get to see newness as well. We're seeing that in our gardens. We're seeing that in the flowers that are coming up. We're seeing that in our own lives as we get deeper into the, the scriptures, Father, and deeper into your word that by your grace we continue to grow. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture this morning for the call to worship comes from Acts 17, 26 and 28. And it says, from one man he created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and exist. This is so neat. Because God in his creation is right next to us. Each individual one of us. He cares that much for us. In fact, he could be even considered to be closer to you than your own breath. Think about that for a minute. He's not trapped within his creation because he created it. He is transcendent. He exists outside of time and space. So therefore, he is the creator, not the creation. And that means that God is sovereign and in control. And yet at the same time, he is so close to us and personal. God is present within the world. Regardless of what the world wants to tell you, he is present. He is here. And even though it doesn't feel like it, he's right there. And he is interacting with each and every one of us. Even those who don't believe, they don't realize that it is God working. And since God is the sum total of all of life, is in getting to know him intimately that you can truly come to know who you are individually and what you were created to be. So as you think about what this verse says, let's hear the words that God has given to Mark this morning as he talks to us about what it means to engage with God's. Thank you, Father, that you have given these words to Mark this morning. We thank you for the many blessings of the day. Let us hear the words that you have for us. Let us take those words and use them in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. partying next door already so well good morning church how's everybody today you know I was really impressed this week I, I find out we have a lot of crafty people in our church not that kind of a crafty but Deb posted up yesterday with something I'd never heard of before which was a peony is it jelly jelly made from flowers so I'm going peony is that like in the flowers she goes yeah 
I'd never heard of that before, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. Lynette has crafted us some prayer shawls. So we're gonna try and find something special to do with those and hand them out to people here. And thank you for doing that. That is awesome. I love that stuff. So uh, as we begin our time of worship this morning, um, let's go to God with prayer, shall we? And then book the Holy Spirit to come with us. Oh, Holy Spirit, come in and join us this morning here as we gather together to hear your word in both message and in song. Lord, and to enjoy the fellowship that we have with one another, that communion, that communion of spirits together, your children, your church coming together in a common bond to hear your word and to learn more about you. Lord, we thank you that we can gather together here freely and openly. Uh, it's not that way in some parts of the world, but Lord, you've, you've made that available for us here today. And we thank you that we have the ability to go online for those who can't join us in person today. So we praise you and thank you in all those things. And we just ask today that you would open our ears to hear that message, for our hearts to accept that message, Lord, and for us to live it out, go and grow with that message each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we continue this week, we're in Tour 5, and this is called The Vision. So we're going to have a series of three sermons that go together, and our three Wednesday night uh, study sessions are on The Vision. And so it is engaging with grace, and then engaging with wisdom, and engaging with truth. And so we're going to explore each one of those things a little bit here today as we learn about how God wants us to engage with our neighbors. Yeah. So I have a question for you today. How is your vision? How is your vision? Now this can have two different meanings. Vision meaning how's your eyesight? Hmm. Oh, go back. Go back to that slide. Okay, okay, okay. here we go. How is your eyesight? Or it could be how well can you see what your future might be? Both of those things are vision. So I, I did the graphic up here on purpose this morning. And if you notice, you're gonna see that part of the type is very clean and clear. But that word vision is a little fuzzy around the edges. And you know, I believe that represents most Christians' understanding of what our future is like. It's a little fuzzy. It's a bit fuzzy. And as we then grow, with God in our relationship, then he reveals more to us. Now, the scriptures tell us all about this, and they, they tell us about it ahead of time. In 1 Corinthians 13, 12, and I took this from the message because I kind of like the way this translated it. We don't see things clearly yet. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be for long before the weather clears, the sun shines bright, we'll see it all then. We'll see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. And see, last time I, I gave my message here, I talked about being and abiding in Christ. And this is what this is all about, because we're, we're not able to see everything clearly, but as we grow in our relationship, then he reveals more and more of his truth to us, more and more of his secrets to us, and then we begin to see clearly, just like a fog is getting listed. And if you got up early enough this morning, you got to see the fog, because there was a lot of it. And as it lifts, then it becomes clear, and it's revealed to us. And so I, th I think that's kind of way our relationship, or our Christianity, our relationship with God is. We're a little fuzzy at the beginning because we don't know exactly what's going on. But as we grow in that relationship, God makes it clear to us by revealing his word to us. So in my message from two or three, we learned about the crown jewel in God's meta-narrative, which is agape love. And in Terry's message last week, we learned about the royal task, which is how we know about the crown jewel and how we need to engage with it, meaning we now know, we now know, and if you remember a couple months ago, I kind of went through this, we now know and now it's time to go and do. 
So we've learned about God's love. We've learned why he has this love for us. Now we need to go out and be fruitful with that message to others. So that is called being fruitful. So the being fruitful is that royal law that we talked about last week. So the first question that I have for you today, because I always do this every time, is if we are to go and do them, why, who, where, and when? Notice I missed them around. Everybody's used to it. I, I just do that myself. Got to throw a curveball once in a while. So in our call to worship this morning, God tells us he created all nations uh, from one man. All nations came from one man. And it tells us the why of it all. It says, his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way and find him. See, that's that fuzziness. That's that fogginess. Our vision isn't clear because he hasn't revealed it to us. So we got to kind of feel our way around. we got to find all these things out about God. And I like this. Uh, I like this exact way that they translated this because... We have to kind of feel our way. We've got to be in touch with it. The more of our senses we get involved in it, the more we're going to retain. And so what, as we feel our way along and he reveals more and more to us, then it becomes very clear for us. And our purpose in God's plan then gets revealed along with it. And then our calling that he has is called into. Each one of us has a calling. They're all different callings. We don't all have the same calling. Terry and I have a little bit together. <laughs> he has a plan for our lives. And so we get to reveal that plan as our relationship to God grows. Which brings us to the who and the where components of that reasoning of he's sending us out into the world to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So baptizing with them in water and in spirit. So that was what we're supposed to be doing and where we're supposed to be going. So the who, Jesus told the apostles and us by extension that we are to go into the world and do these things. We are in to make disciples of all people. So that gives us the who and where, but I still think we need to make that a little bit more clear because in reality, that's a pretty big territory go into all the world. That's a pretty big territory. And it's a whole lot of people that we'd have to come into contact with. So he's got the greatest plan of all, and that is as we take on our responsibilities and we reach out to our sphere of influence and then they reach out to their sphere of influence and they reach out to their sphere of influence. Yeah, you're safe back there. Then it's a logarithmic progression. I don't want to take you back into math class, but that means it grows exponentially, not linearly, but exponentially, which means it grows really quick, really fast, if we all are doing our part. So we need to look a, bit, a little bit closer to home instead of looking at the whole world as our task. We need to involve our sphere of influence first, our neighborhoods, our people that we know, our church, those kind of people. We all know people that need to hear the word of God desperately. I know many that need to hear it desperately. So how about we start small and work big? How about your neighbors? Okay, so we talked about neighbors here a couple of weeks ago. Terry talked about them again last week. So if you remember in my message, I talked about my neighbors. Ooh, yeah, those guys. <sighs> They're a challenge. But see, as we go through the trials and the challenges of our life, it's how God teaches us to grow. And it's a learning opportunity. It's a learning experience for us to go out and do. So if we didn't have those challenges, we couldn't learn and we couldn't grow. So yeah, I've got really challenging neighbors over there. Doesn't mean I can't just say, okay, wait a minute. But, you know, one of the things I think of when I talked about my neighbors, how do you start with them? And so I said, okay, start small and go big. So I think I had a little bit better plan on how to attack this. So I'm going to start with the neighbors that aren't really uh, a challenge, and then I'll work my way up to the others. 
Well, that's what Lori and I have already done. So we started this out a, a couple of years ago. We started with neighbors across the street, and believe me, it was a rough go at first. I mean, it was a rough go. But then things turned around, and see, we've been praying for them to come into a relationship with God, and they're getting closer and closer and closer as we go. And I think it's really neat. So they reached out to us because their son is getting married in September. And so they wanted us, wanted me to come and perform the ceremony for them. So I'm going, ooh, God's working in these people's lives. So as I've talked to her a little bit on and off, uh, then she became friends on Facebook. She's reading all these memes, and then all of a sudden she's posting these things up about God in her life and everything. It's not me doing it. It's God working through it. And so that that relationship is now started with a brand new yet-to-be family member coming in. And I think God's working from the backside as well. But see, that's, that's what I say. God is good. He's got the plan, but we have to step up and we have to do our part. And so we start with the neighbors across the street. We're very close friends now. And what happened next was the coolest part of all. Because those neighbors started talking to the other neighbors around our area. And then those neighbors started to talk to us. And now we know like half the block. But it all started by taking that first step. We had to step out of our comfort zone. We had to kind of go to... And they weren't exactly receptive at first. I'll just put it that way. Um, but you know, now they've stepped out of their comfort zone, went around to the people that they knew in the neighborhood, and now we have a neighborhood family that has become. And so it is God working in all of those, engaging those neighbors, starting slowly, start off with one set of people in there, but now look what God has done. And uh, so now we have this neighbor that's on the back side of our block. So I met him, kind of talked to him a little bit. Now he's from Mexico, so he's Mexican. So he speaks very broken English. Great guy, just wonderful guy. So I said, oh, you've got a landscaping business. Why do you have all these nasty weeds out and everything in the back back here? And I'm traveling all the time. So what would you think about doing a little bit of work there? And we'll pay you for it. And so he did. He did an awesome job. And by the way, his wife has a restaurant right up the street up here. And if we want Mexican food, that's where we go. It's Rios Burritos. So the last name is Rios. And it's great food. So you, you gotta check it out. Um, but the neat thing is, now we have this friend on the back side of the block. And we got to meet his wife. And so I was reading some stuff through. Somebody wanted to know a Mexican restaurant. And so I said, oh, you have to try these guys. They're absolutely authentic food. It's absolutely wonderful. And so it wasn't even 45 minutes later, and I get this thank you for doing that from his wife up here at the restaurant. So in the middle of these things, God is working this thing through, but it takes that first step. It wasn't a really hard first step. It was a little bit challenging. But now it has developed into a great relationship. It all comes being down to being willing to step up and then step out and engage someone new. It's really easy to get engage those people who are in our circle already. Well, sometimes some people have some challenging uh, issues with their personalities. But, you know, you have to step up and you have to say, who haven't I talked to yet? You don't know that they may not be receptive, and this is what they've been waiting for, is someone to talk to them about it. So we all did it right here at church. So how's that going for you? A few years ago, we didn't know most of the people here. But now we have a relationship built with the people. God is good. So Dr. Tackett brings up a point. Why do you think you live where you live? Why do you think you live where you do? See, here's the thing. Another way to consider this would be, what could be the reason you are planted where you are? 
God sent you in there. Now, Lori and I, we sold our house a few years ago when mom had Alzheimer's. We had to move in around the block so we could help take care of her because my dad couldn't do it all by himself. So we left the neighborhood that we knew and our friends and everybody that we had, had a 20 year relationship. We moved over here. We planted ourselves here, or God planted us there. And now we're starting that new circle, that new uh, circle of friends and then influence. Now the word planted here is used on purpose. I, I wanna make sure you understand that. It means that we were being sent there for part of God's plan. You have to be receptive to allowing God to work his plan in your life. That means his will is above ours. And so if you're willing to do that, then he will plant you into the different situations that he needs you to be an influence in. We have to be willing, we have to be receptive to that. So think about where, when you move to where you live now. I just kind of want you to kind of envision that. Did you know anyone that lived there when you moved there? Well, most likely not, right? Right? Do you know any of them now? What changed? How did it change? You had to make that first step to talk to your neighbors. And then you get around to the point like, my neighbors were out of town yesterday and it was raining and they had packages delivered. And they said, I don't want their packages ruined. So I walked across the street, but I took my two-wheeler with me. I loaded the packages on the two-wheeler and I took them over and I put them in my garage. And then we messaged them to say, hey, we brought your packages in out of the rain because I didn't want them destroyed. Well, that was phenomenal. So he brings his card back in, gets in town, brings over a card and gives it to Lori. And it's a thank you card in there. But see, we didn't have that relationship six years ago, or four years ago, or two years ago. But that's the kind of relationship we have now. And it all takes that first step. So ask yourself why you now know some of the neighbors in your neighborhood how it came about, because it was of a certain need or emergency that you had to help them with. A lot of times we come together because of those kind of things. So I met some of our neighbors by helping to clear out our street because you could, it was impassable after the derecho. So here we were, total strangers, out there working side by side, breaking our necks. <laughs> cutting down the trees because the neighbor's tree fell over, hit our house, came down across our driveway, all the way out on the street, it's a huge tree. Uh, I'm really thankful it wasn't my tree in my front yard because I got the biggest one on the block and it, it would have wiped everything out. But see, we had this common purpose. We were working side by side as total strangers for people that I've never met, never talked to at all. But we worked together. God brought us together. And I want you to hang on to that thought. We had a common purpose and we brought together in a very bad situation. See, God took a bad situation and made something good from it. We have to understand we need to change our perspective. We need to change our perspective so that we can understand and see the purpose that is serving in here. A lot of us are just looking at all the damage that was done, right? Our house, our roof, our siding, my truck totaled out, you know. It was a bad situation. But God took that bad situation. He made something good for that. And if that sounds vaguely familiar, let's take a look at Romans 8, 28. And we know all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Do you think it was an accident that we all had to go out and work together? And now we know each other? Now we help each other out? Huh. How about that? We were called by God to go out and help serve each other. Our neighbor wasn't even home. He didn't live there anymore. But we took care of this tree. We took care of all the damage. We took care of all the rest of the stuff. God called us into a purpose. He took something very, very bad and made something good out of it. So I have to ask you this morning, 
Another question already, how about this? What do you think that purpose might be that God brought you together with your neighbors? Remember, what did Jesus tell us? He says to love your neighbor as yourself, right? And isn't it awesome when all of a sudden the scriptures come to life before your eyes? You're out there loving on your neighbor by taking care of the duration damage of them. And it wasn't just one tree, it was many trees. And it took a long time to do it. But it didn't seem like work at the time. I mean, it was tough. But we worked together and we got the job done. So here we just came through this devastating disaster. And God is working for good in the midst of all the bad. So God has always promised us. He says... I'll bring you through. And he tells us what? When you go to that valley of shadow of the death, I will be with you. <clears throat> he didn't say, I'm going to keep you out of the valley and I'm not going to make you go through the hard times. But I'm going to be with you. And God is with us as we go through this stuff so that we can learn from the stuff. And he brings us out better than when we went in. Better than when we went through that storm in life. So, we should never underestimate God and the work that he is doing in our lives. We have to open our ears to hear, our eyes to see the wonders and the glory of God. Because he's working these miracles, and that's a miracle, bringing all the people together in the midst of that devastation. It's a miracle to bring those people together you may not recognize it at the time, but then all of a sudden this aha moment comes and hits you and goes, wow, that was God working in this situation. And you have to say to yourself, man, we serve an awesome God. We really do. And when? Well, guess what? He's working in our lives all the time. Anytime he needs to use us to affect the lives of another, we may not realize that we affect one person and then that person can have an effect on, many, on the lives of many others. So that brings me up to my next point. We need to look at the people in their situations at any point in time in their lives. We may only see the bad portions of that thing that that person is going through in their lives, but God still has a plan for them. God still has a plan for that bad situation they're going through. Okay? And so what did he do? He takes that bad situation, he brings you in to be his hands and feet to serve that other person. And in doing so, he takes a bad situation and makes something good about it. Now we can take a look at this. A uh, prime example of this in the scriptures is Saul of Tarsus. Everybody know who Saul of Tarsus is? Right? So Saul was a man of God. Saul was a man of God. He was a Pharisee. He knew the scriptures inside out and backwards. He believed that what he was doing was the will of God. But in reality, he was doing the opposite of what God wanted him to be doing. The absolute opposite. He thought he was serving God. He was going through the prayers. He was fulfilling the law of Moses at the time. But in reality, he was doing exactly the opposite of what God was calling him to do. So let's remember that, calling him to do. Saul was killing and terrorizing Christians all in the name of God. That's exactly what he was doing. Terrorizing, killing them, throwing them into prison, condoning their deaths. So let's look at God in action. We start in Acts 7, 51. Stephen is calling out the hypocrites in the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Pharisees. He calls him out in a very stern way. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. So he's calling out generations of these people. He says, not only you, but your forefathers before you were no good. Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? 
And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers yourself. Who have received the law by the direction of the angel, angels and not kept it? He didn't pull any punches there whatsoever. I mean, this was, wow. He was really calling them out. In the vernacular of those days there, you know, it was horrible what he was telling these people. But he was the truth the whole time. But see, he was, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit at the time. He was emboldened to call them out for their behavior towards Christians towards their behavior towards Christians. And in the midst of all that was Saul. Saul was standing right there. So we'll jump ahead here to Acts 1, or Acts 8, 1 through 31. Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. And some other devout men came and buried Stephen with great mourning. So if we remember, after Stephen called out these people from the Sanhedrin, they stoned him to death. And Saul was right there in amongst them. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women and throwing them in prison. Oh, okay, sure. No, it's a way. So he, here we see this very, very bad situation that was going on. They had just got done stoning Stephen to death. And they were all witnessing to it. And they think what? They were doing the will of God. They were fulfilling the law of Moses because, you know, he had, he had blasphemed them. Telling these people that they were no good, that they were hmm, kind of a, like a brood of vipers. Sound familiar? We see a very bad situation that was causing Christians in the young church then to scatter in fear for their lives. But God had a plan for all of this. In the middle of all of the persecution, God worked his plan. So right in the middle of all this horrible stuff going on, God works his plan. So meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath, meaning this was his full-time occupation. He did nothing, nothing else. And he was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest, and he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation then in the arrest of any followers of the way. That's what they were called at the time. That they would be found. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. He wanted to make a big spectacle out of this. If you're going to follow this guy, this is what you get. Persecuting, terrorizing these people. And as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? asked Saul. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And so, the men with Saul, because he was traveling with an entourage, the men with Saul stood speechless, because they heard the sound of someone's voice, but didn't see it. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions then led him into the city, led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now, if you know what that's about, he was fasting for a sin that he may have committed. That was the law of Moses. That's what this is for. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling him, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he replied. And the Lord said, Go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. Now, notice this is God calling out the street that the guy is on by name. Do you think God knows where you live? Absolutely. 
Do you think this is part of God's plan? Absolutely. So go to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. And if I were him, I'd be praying pretty hard too. I have shown him in a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. So then, here's Ananias. He thought, wait a minute, Saul of Tarsus, I know this guy, right? So what's he doing? He's going around persecuting people, terrorizing Christians, and killing people in the name of God. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Wow. So let's think about this. Was Ananias ready to just jump up and go? Oh, no, man. He goes, I'm fearing for my life here. And rightfully so. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he's authorized by the leading priest to, to arrest everyone who calls on your name. And the Lord said, go. He didn't say, okay, well, you know, I, I can give you a pass on this. He said, no, he said, go for Saul is my chosen instrument. The plan for Saul's life was already in place. God was working this plan in the midst of all the terrible things that were going on and the killing of people, stoning of Stephen in the midst of all these things going on. God says, I got my plan. I want him to be a part of my plan and I am going to use him for good. But what else does he say? Let's jump down a little further. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Didn't say he was getting away with it for free, did it? Okay, if we read the, the letters, we know how much Saul had to suffer in the name of God. In the name of God. So God took a very bad situation and turned it to good. Saul was transformed, literally transformed. And he was a changed man. Of course, his name was changed to Paul and he went on to write 14 books of the New Testament which have spoken to millions and millions of people who have read it in many languages around the world. Does any of this sound familiar? Go into all the world and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Part of God's plan. So he took Saul, a man that was putting Christians to death. His mission was a death mission. But there is another point in here I want you to see. At the same time, a lesser recognized example of God, of God in action was there with Ananias. He had a real reason not to go on this mission, and it's called death. Death. But see, God knew better. Ananias was emboldened by the Holy Spirit to go and face the unknown and do the will of God. It was a shining example to the rest of the disciples and to the rest of the believers. Remember the disciples, the apostles did not get scattered. So do you think they didn't hear about all this? Oh yeah, they heard about it loud and clear, right? So it was a shining example to the rest of the disciples that God would take care of them. What less would he do for us today? He's gonna take care of us. We're gonna have to face that trial, but he's gonna be right there with us and he's gonna bring us through it. And as we saw, better than what he was before. See, it shows that even when we are hesitant to go and do, God still has that plan. And he's got a plan for us. And he's got to bring us through it. He wants us to step out and step out of our comfort zone and do his will for our lives. That's really important. So I want you to hang on to that. 
He wants us to step up and step out and go and do the will that he has for our lives. His will. How many times do we fight against God? Because we don't go and do what God calls us to do. But see, when we do that, we don't know what blessing God has for us later on. And so we miss out on it. We miss out on it. Now back to the tour. Our neighbors and the vision of God, a.k.a. his will. Okay? We're to reach out into our neighbors and go. And Dr. Tackett shares what he believes is the vision. So the vision of God is a Christian family committed to the shalom. That means doing God's will for these people in their lives and for the betterment of their lives, of their neighbors. We will build a real relationship with those providentially in our Jerusalem, meaning we're going to do it within this, that circle of influence I talked about earlier, our neighborhood, our church, our friends, our workplace people. Okay? That's providentially our Jerusalem, if you will. But he goes on to tell us that we need to do it with prayer and action. We can't just sit back and... We want to start it with prayer because that puts God in the midst of the plan. And then we need to step up and do. But we need to do it with grace and wisdom and truth. Remember I told you that vision, we have three different messages. Well, they're all tied together. So this is the first one. So this is talking about grace. Next week's message is going to be on wisdom. And then the week after that is going to be on truth. That's all part of that vision that God has for us. See, this isn't a vision that just applies to anybody else out there. This is his vision for us. Being attractively winsome. Now, how many people know what the word winsome means? Inviting, right? Engaging. So we want to be attractively winsome with our neighbors, meaning not confrontational, attractively winsome. We want to make friends with these people. We want to tear down the walls that exist, building up trust and doing the work of the kingdom all at the same time. It's not a big task. And it's a step-by-step -step plan if we take a look at it. So he goes on to tell us that nothing will happen if we don't make a commitment to the Lord that this is what we are going to do as a family. Now, we as a church, we are a family. So he's calling us into that same mission as a church. So we need to engage with our neighbors. We need to start building real relationships with those providentially in our Jerusalem. And that is where God has planted us. We were talking in the men's group yesterday about the vine and the, and the branches and being pruned and those who are no longer bearing fruit get thrown into the fire because the branches at that point in time are worthless. But see, we also talked about something else. Terry's company, U.S. Cellular, got bought by T-Mobile, and he's going, eh, what do I do now? Because nobody's sure when that happens if they're going to do a job. Now, I work in acquisitions, so I'm used to this stuff all the time. But when we got acquired, I had the chairman of the board say, hey, we're not sure we have a job for you. We don't know what your job would be. And I'm going, oh boy, I'm 60 years old. Now what? And I got to tell you, it's not a great feeling to have. But see, then a little while later, and it was like six weeks later, I go to Des Moines and I get a meeting with the executive vice president. And he goes, oh, well, let me clarify this a bit. So I've got to wait a long time in this kind of vape zone, if you will. And he says, the problem was is we have six different departments that want you. We just don't know how to work with you or what we're going to do. So they created a department. I'm a department to myself. And then I consult to everyone else. And that's what he meant by it. <laughs> so God has a plan and he's going to plant us where we can bloom, where we can be fruitful and where we can multiply by his works. By him planting us where I've been, 
I was put in charge of IT operations for all of our branch offices. I come into contact with a lot of people. We've got uh, 4,000 employees now. I come into contact with a lot of people. I also do the acquisition work. So I get to meet all of our new clients at the same time. And if you ever wanted to know if God was, was at work in your life and then he was in control, a year ago, I was out in North Platte, Nebraska, and we just acquired a company out there, and we were just going through the steps of the acquisition, and I was in North Platte. And so I had a lady ask me, one of the, one of the people from the company we acquired, she goes, well, what's your last name? And I said, Hickson. And she said, how do you spell that? And I said, H-I-X-S-O-N. My mom wants to talk to you. And so they have this massive set of buildings out there across town. So I went over to those buildings and I went to talk to Bonnie. And Bonnie goes, so your last name's Hickson. Um, do you have any relatives named David? I said, well, that was my great grandfather. She goes, oh, okay. So she says, just a minute. She brings me back this article. It's all about my great grandfather. She says, that's my grandfather. And I went, whoa. <laughs> so we started talking about that. We started talking about all kinds of other things. And we came in, got into the question. We started talking about God and how he works in our lives. And she says, I have something for you. And so we went through, the, and you have to understand how big these buildings are. I think they're probably... Uh, 40 foot wide by 100 feet long, filled. When I say filled, I mean filled with antiques. There's little pathways going in there. So we go strolling back through these warehouses, and she goes, ah, here it is. She brings up this needle point, and it's of the Last Supper. She says, your great-grandmother made this. How much you have it? God talked to me that day. Wow. Blew me away. Right? Blew me away. You never know, as God plants you into a situation, what the influence is going to be. But see, that wasn't the only example. So I've got that needle point. I, I think I'll bring it in here for you guys. But it was an example of, you know, you're, you're 700 miles away. And here's somebody, by the way, we're related. And by the way, this is from your great grandmother. I just went, wow. I had never met him. My grandfather died when I was a year old. Never got to know any of these people. But I was in Fort Myers, Florida. So we're going to travel 1,800 miles the other way. And I'm talking to one of the ladies in the office. She goes, I'm from Iowa. And I said, oh. She said, I'm from Kiyosakwa. I said, I got relatives in the Kiyosakwa. She goes, really? Who are they? And I said, well, it's Bern Ramsey. And she goes, what? She says, Bern Ramsey raised me. Oh my gosh. And I went, wow. And so we got to talking about different things there and family. And then I went back and I was telling my dad about it. He goes, well, let's go down and visit Vern. And so we went down to visit Vern in Kiyosakwa. And it was the first time my dad had seen Vern since the 1950s. Vern passed away the week after that. But we got to know him. And they gave me all of this family history that they had been collecting over the years. None of that would have happened had I not been part of this company and this is part of my job and I go to Fort Myers, Florida to meet a relative. It's amazing what God can do. But nothing will happen if we don't make commitments to the Lord and this is what we're going to have to do as a family. As a family together. We need to engage with our neighbors. We need to start building real relationships in our providentiality our Jerusalem provincially God has a plan for us we never know what that plan is going to be so 
So what's it gonna look like? Well, a real relationship cannot be done at arm's length. You can't do it remotely. To have a good relationship, you have to have regular, close contact. We do that with God, how? Well, we do that, God, with prayer and in his word. The guidelines. Well, Dr. Tackett also gave us some guidelines. A real relationship is not shallow. Not shallow, meaning you have to have a depth of an understanding of the other person in order to have a relationship with them. It has to be friendly. A real relationship needs to be friendly. You have to have a basis of friendship. What is the key to most everything? Communicating. You have to be a good communicator. If Lori and I didn't communicate as well as we did, we've been married, well, we've been together for 32 years. We've never had a fight once. Never. Never raised our voices to each other. This next one I like a lot, and it shows eating together. As we commune together, as we dine together, and if you notice all of the feasts of the Jewish communities, they brought people together to keep that bond between the people by eating feasts, eating meals together. What did they do? He got the disciples together. They had a communal meal to build the bond, to build a true, a real relationship. Doing projects together, chopping up trees, clearing the roadway. But a real relationship, and I want you to hold on to this. I, I put it in parentheses because I didn't know how else to really do it. I could have underlined it and put it italicized and all that stuff. But a real relationship takes trust. It takes time. And it has to be authentic. You can't, I mean, if you look at social media today, you never know what you're going to get when you click on a profile. Is that the real person or isn't it? Because there's a lot of fakes out there. A lot of them. But to have a real relationship, you need to be as authentic with them as they are with you. Meaning you've got to let down your guard. You've got to let down the walls and you've got to let people in. You've got to go outside of your comfort zone to let those people in. That takes trust. It's not going to happen on your first meeting. That's going to take time in order to be authentic. It all fits together. So, do you have friendships with your neighbors? Those prominently in your Jerusalem. Okay? Do you have friendships with your neighbors? What kind of things do you like to do together? What about your friendships at church? What do those look like? What do you do together? Are these relationships built on trust, on time, and are they authentic? Because if they're not built on those three things, you're an acquaintance. You're not in a relationship. You're an acquaintance. If you don't have any of these real relationships with your neighbors, with those within your sphere of influence, have you asked yourselves, why not? Why not? Have you been hesitant to engage with your neighbors? Well, some of us, yes. I've got some neighbors. I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to approach them properly because I got one that is just loose cannon. And his uncle's a friend of mine here. And I'm going, Pfft. he goes, yeah, join the rest of the family. We're all going like this. So Dr. Tackett points out some of the reasons you hesitate. A lack of making time, a lack of taking the effort necessary, a lack of sacrifice. Any of this sound familiar? Hesitance to overcome the walls that separate you. Dr. Tackett says it's highly probable that the only real relationship your neighbor will ever have with a Christian is you. See, that hope brings us all the way back to that royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that with a wall separating you. You can't have an authentic relationship, a real relationship, if the walls are up. If the walls are up. You can't, you gotta tear down the wall. You can't walk around, you can't peer over the top of the well. I guess you can if your name's Wilson. 
you can peer over the top of the wall and have a relationship with your neighbor. But see, that was at arm's length. You gotta love your neighbor as yourself. And if we take that to heart, really take it to heart, it kind of stings a little bit. Because a lot of times we're not willing to love our neighbors as ourselves. So how does that make you feel? Hmm. It's a lot like a Jewish mother laying on the guilt trip. Okay, so when I wrote this, Lori was watching The Big Bang Theory and in the background while I'm writing my sermon. And guess what was going on in the show? Yeah, Mrs. Wallowitz was laying the guilt trip yeah. on Howard. Yeah. So to overcome this, we need to have a plan of action. We can't just willy-nilly just walk out and just start up a conversation. We need to have a plan of action. And it needs to start with what? It needs to start with prayer. We need to bring God into the situation because God's trying to work a plan for their lives at the same time he's working a plan for yours. So we've got to bring him into the fold, so to speak. Right? So, it must be done with grace, with truth, and wisdom. We have to understand that each time we go in to make that new relationship. Because if we don't go in with grace, meaning... We gotta be willing to do what? Forgive as we've been forgiven, right? Grace. We gotta do it with truth. We gotta lay down our walls. And it has to be done with wisdom. We'll go through truth and wisdom later on. So Dr. Tackett gives us some guidelines for this as well. And to be able to reach out and to step out of our comfort zone and go into that sphere of influence. How do we do it? Well, we need to do it through prayer and action. We have to pray as a family for opportunities to go out and work God's will in any given situation. We have to learn the people's names. You can't have a real relationship until you know their name. You can't have that relationship. Plan loving deeds and acts of kindness. Go over and take your neighbor's boxes off the front porch. You've got to have a good relationship to do that first so they don't think you're a porch party. <coughs> but it's loving deeds and acts of kindness is something as simple and small as that but it can make a big difference if whatever was in those boxes got rained on and got destroyed only took you took me I think maybe two minutes mm -hmm. to do that we have to practice hospitality and then have fun doing it have fun together if we practice these items it'll help us tear down the walls build up the trust the foundations to building a real relationship. Paul's letter to the Colossians, he tells a very different story when he first began as Saul. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response from everyone. Words mean things. Man, you got to understand that one before you go in. I, I, well, we won't go into that today. That's for a whole other sermon. If we commit to stepping up and stepping out into our neighborhood, our sphere of influence, and we bring God into it from the very start, by prayer and petition with an earnest heart, he will answer the prayer and the results will be amazing. And if that seems like that sounds like a scripture to you, God has laid it all out on his word. we got to read his word and other to know what he's telling us to do. Because that's a scripture. Changing the world one neighbor at a time. So Terry knows, Lori knows, we've gone through something called the walk to Emmaus, right? And uh, the last thing they ask is as we're closing out, as we each... Uh, as a pilgrim came through the walk. The very last thing is we get to get up in front of the rest of the group and we say, now that you know the love of God, and I'm going to use this paraphrasing in here, now that you know what God is doing in your life and what God has planned for you in your life, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? You just figured out all this because I just gave it to you. What are you going to do about it? Let us pray. Gracious God, Wow. Thank you for the message this morning. Thank you for using me as your instrument. 
thank you for prompting me, not once, not twice, but many, many, many times over, to respond to the call that you were putting on my life. To step up and step out of the world. Step up and step out of who I thought I was. Step up and step out and step into a relationship with you that is real, that is true, and that is authentic. Thank you, Father God, that you've talked to us about this here today, and that we might be able to, to reach out into the world that you have created, and we could bring some of those people back in, even just one person at a time, because we know that your work and your will as it runs forward will be multiplied many, many times. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you have given us the opportunity to have Grace Street Church and to bring this message to other people in person, in message, and in song. So we just ask that you would help us take this message to heart today and live it out each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' precious name. grace acted out by Jesus. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take me. And then later in the meal, he takes the cup. And after filling it, he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. Scripture reminds us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we are to do so until Christ returns. This is the grace that God has given us each and every day. We stumble, we fall, we get back up, we dust ourselves off because we have God's grace and forgiveness. The body of Christ broke you take me. The blood of Christ shall be take me. Father, each week that we come together and we have this meal, we're reminded of your incredible grace. We're reminded that it doesn't matter what our past looks like. murderers, drugs, thieves, adulterers. And those are just some of the people in the Bible that we read about. It doesn't even include us. But yet, you're as close to us or closer than our own breath, Father. Thank you for this grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just let the Holy Spirit rest upon us as we pray. And we thank you, God, for this sermon. We thank you for this prayer you've given me today. May it be a blessing to others. Father God, we come before you today to glorify your holy name. Let us rest in your presence with the Holy Spirit who dwells among us. As it states in Psalms 91, 1 and 2, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We thank you, Jesus, that when we face trials of all kinds, you are there walking with us. You hold on to us, giving us courage, clarity, and wisdom to make it through. Because you never leave us, <clears throat> excuse me, or forsake us. Thank you for holding on and holding us together in this past couple weeks. Father, we come to you and ask that you will that your will be done in Israel. We also pray that the war will soon be over 
and that all the captives will be found and released to their families. You alone can make this happen, Lord Jesus, so we trust you in all these things. Father God, I lift up all online and who are here in church, and my brother David, who is fighting a new battle <coughs> with leukemia, lymphoma, and bladder cancer. We ask for a vision for the doctors to know the exact treatments to give them that will take the cancers away, Father God. During their trials, help them to read your word and bring them closer to you each and every day. Father, we ask for help for all the people in all the states that have been ravished by hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods. Comfort the families of those who have lost loved ones. And uh, please bring neighbors out to help each other. As your second greatest commandment states, love your neighbor as yourself. Help those that are able to be your hands and feet to show your love to one another, Lord. And Father God, we thank you for our children and grandchildren. We thank you for the joy they bring to their families. And if they swerve to the right or to the left and they try to fall away from you, Father God, pull them back to you. Hold on to them and never let them go. Father God, we praise you for taking care of our homeless. Keep them healthy and always open doors for them to give them hope. Father, let us never forget Isaiah's 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is to come. You are God, the mighty creator, Yahweh Elohim. And if you would like to invite Christ Jesus into your life today, repeat after me. Father God, I come to you today. I accept you. I accept the knowledge that you died on the cross and you rose again three days later to take away the sins of the world. I believe in you. I want to ask you into my life. Let the blood of Jesus cover me and the Holy Spirit be alive in me today and for the rest of my life. In Jesus' holy name. And we thank you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Denise. It, it uh, never ceases to amaze me how God works together in all these things. Because if you listen to a prayer, we don't talk no, before no. this is done. No. But how many times uh, does your prayer message that you wrote out match up yeah. to the sermon that we just heard? God is good. Yes. He's an awesome God. Yeah. If you ever wonder if God's working in this church, there's your evidence right there. Amen. There's your evidence. Uh, so this brings us to a, the close of our online portion of our service today. We thank you for being with us today. Please leave us a comment in there and uh, listen to the music. I had a real struggle this time because I, I actually, I, looking at my message, I try and make sure that the message in the music fits the message of the message in the word. And I had a list of over 10 songs. We're not going to do 10 songs today. Um, sorry. Um, but it is really tying in well. And uh, so hopefully you can click on the link. I, the first link didn't work when I put it up this morning. The second link worked just fine. So uh, you should be able to click on that. And like Pastor Sherry said, if you have any problems whatsoever, message your church and we can get you out the, the link to listen to the music. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we come before you today with a humbleness of heart. We've all messed up and fallen short of the glory of God, but you assure us that it's not where we have to stay. Lost in a lost world. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your unending love and your forgiveness. Help us to be strong in you, strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and bringing us into your glory. Restore us and reconcile us. Redeem us today, Lord. We pray this in your holy name embolden us and empower us to walk out and step out and step up to reach out to others for a true and authentic relationship with them. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you give us this safe harbor to come to to honor and worship you each and every week. 
in Jesus' name.